Okay, so next up, I'll bring, I'll make sure Jan is ready to go. So Jan is here. Yeah, there he is. Hello, Jan. Good morning. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you, Josh. How are you? I'm okay. I mean, that must have been a problem with click meeting then, uh, if everybody's yes. connection out at the yeah, same time. Yeah, I, I, I was kicked out as well. Huh, okay. Well, let's see. Let me get your presentation up. Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Jan Bergerhoff. He is going to be talking about the largest labor market in the world by 2030, how to better assess applications from India. Uh, Dr. Jan Bergerhoff is one of the founders of Candidate Select, or CASE, and a research fellow at the School of Business and Economics at Maastricht University. He is also the co-initiator of the study series Fakhlaft 2030, an ambassador, more importantly in this case, for the German-Indian Startup Exchange Program, which is sort of how this research came about and he'll be talking about very shortly. More importantly than that, as you might know if you were at the last talk, he is one of my bosses, so I'm going to have to be very careful indeed, but I don't think he's normally so unreasonable or strict, although I would say that right now, wouldn't I? So if you're happy to proceed, Jan, then I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Josh. So many titles, so now I have to <laughs> try to, to uh, live up to that. I will um, I will uh, close my video for the uh, for the duration of the talk because I always think it's then easier and nicer to to look at the slides. But I will turn it back on for the for the uh, presentation. Um, thank you very much, Dave, as well. Um, I uh, sort of uh, missed the first part uh, of your talk, but we are recording this, and I will make sure to to also see the the first part. Um, I thought what you said in the end was very very interesting and very. Um, very good. Um, today, I will present you one of the people analytics um, tools that exist. And it's a unique tool in the sense that, um, uh, at least as far as we are aware, nobody else has been, has been looking at um, formal education as a predictor of job performance and job success as much as uh, we have done that at CASE. And um, I will give you a brief introduction um, on how we do that. And then I will focus on one of the other big trends um, at the moment, which is that um, there is a country um, where the labor force is growing um, incredibly strongly, um, starting even from a big base, and um, which uh, sends out lots and lots and of um, workers and, and helpers to other countries and um, which will do so even more in the future. And of course, I'm talking about India and we'll be um, discussing on how to assess uh, applications from India fairly and to how to make the most of them um, essentially for your, for your own business and for your own recruiting effort. Um, when I'm saying we, who do I mean? Um, I'm of course referring to the case team. Uh, we are about uh, 10 people. Um, full-time people at the moment, 15 if you count interns, um, and this was before the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, now, of course, many people have been uh, resigned to home offices, or to, to the home office, although uh, with the, with the uh, loosening of the restrictions in Germany, um, the office is also becoming slightly more populated now. So, so much maybe for an, for an introduction, and now I, I hope I can give you some real content and uh, live up to that, uh, <laughs> to that introduction from Josh. Um, yeah, why are we talking about higher education degrees? Um, I know many of you are from, from different country backgrounds, and of course it would be nice to basically have examples, uh, local examples from all your, uh, from, from the different countries. Um, I'm mostly now comparing today Germany and India. Germany because we simply have a lot of data in Germany and we, we've researched Germany very well. Um, but I think many of the trends which I'm showing you will also be applicable um, to your own countries. Um, so the number of students in Germany since the 1990s has gone up from about 1.6 million to, say, 2.7 million um, at the moment. And that translates itself into about 450,000 graduates um, each year. Now, if I compare this to the number of students in India, um, you will see, I will make my pointer public. 
just a second. Yes. Okay. So if I compare this to the number of students in India, um, you will see that the change in Germany barely features. Uh, if you put it on the on the scale, uh, India going from from five million in 1990 to almost 40 million or approaching 40 million now, you see that this is a, a development on a completely different scale. And um, in the top left corner, um, we've put the tertiary enrollment ratio for you, which is um, which is a measure used also in in country comparisons. Um, so it's a bit broad and it's. Uh, um, uh, which 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 uh, tries to describe what percentage of the population is in education after secondary school. Uh, in Germany, this education might also uh, comprise some apprenticeship schemes, and uh, but in most other countries, this is mostly universities and polytechnic schools and maybe community colleges. And you see that this number, the tertiary enrollment ratio in India is 25.8 percent. Um, while in Germany, it is 68.3%. And of course, maybe that is not the best comparison. But if you think about Brazil, for example, if you think about China, um, then these countries are nearing 50% tertiary enrollment ratio. And uh, India's uh, enrollment ratio has been rising constantly. And so it's not out of this world to expect that it will also reach 50% at some point. And then, of course, we are not talking about 40 million students, but we are talking about 80 million students. And we will not be talking about 7 to 8 million graduates each year in India, but we're talking about 16, maybe 20 million graduates each year. And um, yeah, this is, a, this is a force um, to be reckoned with in the in the uh, in the international global labor market, because many of these graduates are well educated, are incredibly bright, um, have had a much tougher time uh, to go to, uh, through the education system than than in the in the West. So they are uh, really uh, really very very capable, and and they also apply. Um, which is maybe something we can talk about when I uh, uh, focus on the on the Indian applications, uh, sort of in the second two thirds of my talk. But um, first, I would like to give you a brief overview of what Case actually does um, using the German example, but very similar. Also, we do the same thing for the United Kingdom, for Portugal, for Spain, for Italy uh, at the moment, and um, yeah, then also to some extent for India, which I'm going to talk about. But first, let's have a look at the, the basic intuition. I have brought you two very nice applicants. Um, the one applicant comes from TU Munich, which if you are uh, slightly familiar with the German universities uh, scene is one of the best universities in Germany, the technical university in Munich. Um, the person has done a bachelor in mechanical engineering in 2016 and the GPA is a 2.0. So the German grading system goes from one to four, one being the best grade um, e equivalent to a very good, two being good, three being satisfactory, and four being just about bearable. And then after that, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fail grade. And if we have this candidate from Munich with a 2.0, and the average grade in that study program is a 2.68, so it's higher, so it's worse, the average grade is worse, um, then this person is in the grade distribution at top 10%. Yeah, if I, if I compare this graph, for example, with an UK example, then I would have here a UK university, and I would have um, the um, the the grade of my candidate might have been a two point two point one. So an, an upper second, and then I compare where does that upper second lie in the grade distribution in the UK, and then Spanish, Portugal, Italy, depending on uh, with their local grades. But we always look and uh, look at their grade distributions, and we con we um, convert that local grade into a percentile of the grade distribution. So, but now back here to our German example. Munich, Bachelor, Mechanical Engineering, top 10%. And we compare this to the University of Heidelberg, also very well-known university with a candidate who did a master in psychology. Now you see it's a completely different study program um, uh, in 2016, also with a, mass, uh, with a grade of 2.0. And here in this study program, the average grade was a 1.3. So it was much better. And so the same nominal grade of 2.0 is equivalent to top 96% in in Heidelberg here and uh, so but for the for the employer for the HR department each 2.0 looks alike 
um, there is typically very little uh, way to basically see whether this was a very successful grade um, or not. And um, you have 30,000 study programs in Germany. Um, internationally, if you count them, uh, it's, it's completely impossible for an HR department to maintain an overview what grade is actually good and uh, what grade is not good in a, in a local uh, in a local context. And um, it's not only us who say this. Um, in Germany, there's a think tank that's advising the German government, Wissenschaftsrat, it's like a the scientific council of the German government. And they already said many years ago, we recommend employers to take into account the university and subject specific grading traditions. Only then do they obtain a valid impression of an applicant's potential. And they would say that, uh, wouldn't they? Because it does. It is. It is simply true. The one criticism maybe one could make from uh, the from the point of view of the of the private sector is they don't tell us how. Yeah, there is no. Um, official guidance, there is no uh, public institution that helps us compare uh, one school to the other. And as far as I know, that same that also doesn't exist in the UK or in almost in, in any other country, um, I think. And in this um, in this void, we recognize this void and we try to answer this void by on the one hand providing great distributions, but not stopping there. So if I summarize, if I would wanted to summarize what CASE does on one slide, that would be the slide. Um, on the left hand side, you see the uh, grade distributions as an ingredient into the CASE score, um, the grade distributions which we saw on the previous slide. So we try to convert a local grade using the context of the grade distribution into a percentile. We say locally at your program, in your year, at your university, where were you? Top 10%, top 20%, top 30%. But that's not where we stop, because if you think about it, um, it is also very important to understand how difficult it was to obtain a certain position in the grade distribution. Because if I'm at a very competitive program, then um, leaving all my classmates behind and getting a very, very good grade is incredibly difficult and incredibly hard. And if I'm in not such a competitive program, um, it is comparably easier. And so we try to assess the competitiveness of the programs by making a ranking. Now, when we do this ranking, we do not use the usual ways of ranking those institutions because essentially we have a people analytics perspective. We care about what can give us the best prediction for job performance. So we do not, we, we are not interested in the historic reputation of an institution. We wouldn't rank Oxford any higher because it's one of the oldest universities and because um, it has a ringing name. But what we do um, is its methodology is slightly different for different countries. Um, for Germany, for example, we have IQ and personality tests of the largest German student survey. So we actually try to measure the IQ and uh, to a lesser extent also the personality um, of the students which are studying there at the moment so that we can assess the competitiveness of the people and from that derive how difficult it was to get a good place uh, in the great distribution. And um, this methodology, um, when, we, when we first came up with it, we didn't know whether it would work or we didn't know whether it would uh, enable a very good prediction. But looking back uh, over those four years, this methodology is incredibly powerful because it delivers two things. It delivers that you can, um, that you get a rather thorough uh, estimate for how strong the person was at university. And it is also um, a relatively fair comparison. Um, one of the concerns I frequently hear when we are talking about these rankings is also, I think, a very legitimate one, is the question of if I'm maybe socially, uh, I'm coming from a, from a, from a, uh, maybe from a working class background, I couldn't move to go to another university, um, I needed to stay in my area, or maybe I wasn't, I didn't have the, 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 I don't know, a, you know, the, the, the knowledge of what, what a you know, good university for my study subject would be, um, am I disadvantaged using this ranking? And the answer to that is if we do, if CASE does their job well, if we do, do our job well, then you're not disadvantaged. Because these things, the way this scoring is, is constructed, these things 
act as substitutes. So if you are in a in a if you are at a school with a lower ranking, you should receive a better point in the grade distribution. And if you move up, given your ability, if you move into a into a program with a stronger ranking, you should then receive a comparably lesser uh, uh, position in the grade distribution, so that the overall case score should not change. The only problem that you sometimes encounter is when you're at the very edges of grade distributions, when you have, for example, the best, the very best person at an institution that is not so strong, or maybe the worst person at an institution that is very strong. But these uh, corner, corner cases are not so uh, relevant for your day-to-day -day, uh, recruiting. Um, having said that, um, we use an optimization algorithm um, to uh, weight these two factors uh, in, a, in an optimal way. We are trying to have that patented, although software patenting is very difficult, um, but it's under review. And uh, in the end, you receive a K-score. And the K-score, after this very long-winded uh, explanation, is then quite a simple thing. Um, you have Bruno and you have Sophie, and they've studied at different universities. Bruno, Master, Mechanical Engineering, Karlsruhe, with an average grade of 1.7. Sophie, Bachelor, Electrical Engineering, uh, and at our now well-known TU Munich, average grade 2.2. And what you get basically is you get the context information. For interest, you get the uh, the information whether both people were in the local grade distribution. Bruno with his 1.7 is at top 40%. Sophie with her 2.2 is at top 27%. But for your recruiting efforts, really important is the case score. And the case score tells you that compared to other students, Bruno is at top 26%. Um, and Sophie is at top 11%. And this is a, a real example from the case database. So although Bruno has a better grade than Sophie, and the difference between 1.7 and 2.2 in the German grading system is half a full grade. That is quite a that is quite a quite a lot. Um, Sophie is the more interesting candidate um, to to uh, to interview and to look at. So if you have limited resources, um, you uh, the the uh, the um, study program would point you to the direction um, of Sophie. And um, we have more than 14 studies at the moment that show that this case scoring is actually uh, as powerful as an indicator for job performance um, as IQ tests are. And um, so I think because we're the only ones who've ever looked at this, there is no uh, scientific evidence in the sense from that it comes from universities or uh, uh, new neutral bodies. Um, uh, and I, I hope um, and I do believe that in the coming years, this will also be um, will also be uh, established as one of the big uh, predictors of uh, of job performance um, uh, next to next to uh, assessment tests. If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because universities spend such a long time, on average, more than five years in the German case, slightly less in the Anglo-Saxon sphere, um, to test and get to know a candidate, and um, they they are not as well comparable as IQ tests, but they pick up a lot of things of long run performance that a test and also an interview in an age in a recruiting situation can never hope to pick up because you are in a typical recruiting situation you are putting the uh, applicant under stress and you make them perform as good as possible under a given amount of time and that is predictable for some forms of job success but the very nice thing about university is that it's such a long-run experience and it captures the ability of motivating yourself day to day of going facing situations that are maybe not perfect perfectly designed uh, for yourself. And um, uh, that is also a very important component of, uh, of job performance and of, of success in the labor market. And it's one of the only things that can vaguely uh, objectively measure that because otherwise you just have job experience and job experience, it's, it's, a, it's maybe closer to what you're looking for, but it's so it's almost impossible to measure because you never know why the person really left their last job and what the success was and etc. So um, maybe so much for why we do what we do. And now I would like to uh, talk a bit about how we could ever hope to really compare degrees from India. Um, because we've been working on this for over two years now, and I can tell you this is a quite a momentous task. Um, why is that interesting? Well, um, I was very briefly alluding to this in the very beginning. 
um, the numbers of the Ingl Indian labor market, they are just striking. Um, the Indian population, which is what the graph shows you here, um, is increasing uh, very rapidly. We've reached more than 1.6 billion people. Or we will be reaching 1.6 billion people by 2050, and we are already, uh, I have to, I'm very short sighted, so I don't maybe see it very well, but we are, I think, at 1.5 billion at the moment, and 600 million people are under the age of 25. And um, these people, they enter the labor force. They get out of childhood, they get out of education, they become members of the labor force. And the Indian state, the Indian economy uh, uh, more, uh, needs to create 10 million jobs each year just to stay put, just not to see unemployment rise. 10 million jobs. And um, if you think about what China has done, uh, over their economic miracle, uh, then in some years they have managed to create 12 million jobs, 13 million jobs. But at least at the moment, it doesn't look like India can uh, can keep up with that. Um, in the last years, Indian job creation has more been on the magnitude of half a million. And so you see there's a huge amount of graduates um, that enter the uh, Indian labor market and find very, very competitive and tough, uh, very competitive and tough situation. Uh, in the in the domestic labor market, and what they do, maybe not very surprisingly, they look abroad. Um, a large portion of the Indian population is English speaking, so 13% maybe doesn't sound that much, but in the in the bracket of university graduates, of course, it is much more. And um, one of the reasons we were pointed to this very early is because some of our clients um, in Germany, we work with a lot of large companies uh, who also um, frequently uh, put up um, job uh, uh, jobs in, in English, uh, job descriptions in English. And when they do this, they receive a lot of applications from India, also from Pakistan. And um, for, for some of the programs we have been asked to provide and uh, assess applicants, we have had 25% every fourth application um, coming, coming from India. And um, the truth, I think, is that uh, HR departments find it at the moment very difficult to deal with these applications because, um, as Dave already said, uh, the, they, they need to have a very high operational efficiency and um, uh, without the uh, metrics to evaluate the quality of hire, um, one typical way to assess human resource departments is by looking at costs and it's very costly to uh, understand an Indian application, especially when we maybe uh, can assume that, um, first of all, everything is a, is a, is a bit different. Um, this is a, a movie which I like very much, the best exotic marigold hotel. This is Judy Dench uh, in an Indian market, and you can sort of see how overwhelmed she is from all the all the impressions. Um, I think it's a, it's a nice it's a nice image for what is uh, what the Indian labor market can be to human resource departments. Um, we have more than 10,000 colleges uh, in India. Yeah? By comparison, Germany has 80 universities and about 400 private institutions. The UK actually has less universities and private institutions. I think we're about 180 or something in, in total. And India just has 10,000. Um, this is um, um, very difficult to, to compare. And then you don't know whether they actually... Um, live up to the standard that you expect for your for your uh, for your recruiting process and um, of course g given that india is a developing country and that many people just shoot out an application um, to some uh, if, if they they think they have even a remote chance the proportion of qualified applicants i think can be assumed to be lower i don't i, I don't have evidence for this but i think it's a it's a uh, it's an um, it's an idea or a uh, or a conjecture um, that at least seems very plausible to me. And then, of course, so it, uh, the the backgrounds are all unfamiliar. You don't know the colleges, you don't know the previous employers, you don't know whether the people might run into visa issues. So you have all these obstacles. And then I think the result of it is that most many HR departments we know um, really disregard Indian applications completely. And that is a big loss at least from from uh, where where I'm sitting, because um, I tend to believe that um, 
uh, intelligence and productivity is roughly equally distributed in, in all places and exists in all societies. And if you have such a huge country like India, there's an enormous amount of talent. And so that I uh, and that we at Case, we believe it's really worth to try to invest um, to find the best applicants uh, from the from the stack of uh, of Indian applications. Um, but to be realistic, I think uh, as a first start, we need a tool that enables a partially automated selection, so that you, um, as an HR department, do not have to do this so manually, but that be more that you get pointed. Okay, this is an applicant you should really spend some time with and understand the background, and maybe because this person has a high probability of being a good fit for your uh, for your open position, and so this tool should should do this automatically. It should of course be uh, have a have a, a, a good precision, and then. Um, this is a point that's also maybe more directed to a, to, a, uh, to a German audience, but might also be interested to an international audience. So in order to get a visa in Germany, you need a stamp of equivalence from a German public body, Central Office of Foreign Education. Um, and uh, uh, when basically this says that the assessment that we give should be in line with what the German Central Office of Foreign Education thinks. And um, that's also maybe also interesting for you. Um, you have a that you have a government body in Germany that is also maybe contributing a bit of the information. Um, let me tell you a bit about this, how this looks like. Um, the German, this German government body basically tries to assess whether this university degree that somebody, an Indian applicant has, um, is equivalent or is, could also be considered a German university degree, uh, a university degree by the German standard. And this process is quite bureaucratic. So an, an applicant has to apply to this public body. They have to pay two, three hundred euros. They have to wait for a long time and then they either get a stamp on their, on their uh, degree or they don't. Um, but the uh, this public body, one very nice thing they do is they have a big database, which we have crawled, um, and they give guidance on which uh, universities they've before and which they have rejected before. And um, one thing we use, and we've, this actually is not new, is we have it for over two years now, um, is that we give out this guidance. And uh, so this, if you want, if uh, also if you have with, uh, with your, um, uh, in your recruiting process is an additional piece of information which we can very easily add on. Uh, would the German government at least consider this equivalent? If this is of any interest to you, you will get it on top of uh, what I'm going to show you now. Um, so this is a basic, uh, a basic intuition of whether this is a higher education degree, but it's not very precise. And um, what other alternatives do you have? Well, I mean, there are some international rankings. Um, there are 56 Indian universities listed in the Times Higher Education Ranking. That's mostly Indian institutes of technology. But as I told you, more than 10,000 colleges 56 out of them i mean it's a little bit useful but it's not uh, it doesn't really solve your problem um, at the end of the day um, and what is new well we now have compiled a database of more than 14603 indian degrees um, and we have real performance criteria we don't have rankings based on uh, the the uh, i don't know the quality of the library or um uh, just a, just an intransparent way of saying, okay, we think this is maybe good or not so good, but we have something for a lot of uh, programs based on real performance criteria. How did we do that? Well, we were a bit desperate uh, in the beginning. Um, I joined the German Indian Startup Exchange in 2018, and this was on the Bangalore Tech Summit, and you see this, uh, this very desperate sign in my very bad handwriting. Do you know anything about Indian educational data? Please come and talk to us. Uh, we had a um, we had a meeting with some uh, Indian politicians. This is the minister. This was the minister for uh, economics of the state of Karnataka, K. C. George, um, and he sent uh, he helped us to get in touch with uh, people from the University Grants Commission in India, and we we were working on this for over two years. And what we have now is we have a huge data set of um, Indian university entrance exams. So in order to get into a technical uh, technical um, 
course at an Indian university, technical course is quite broad, is um, more in the in the STEM uh, sense of um, so science, technology, uh, engineering, math. Um, is uh, uh, the this technical uh, definition in India captures a lot of different subjects. And if you want to uh, enter such a such a course, you have to sit an exam. Um, in many states, it is the JEE mains exam, but in many other states, it's also an individual exam. For example, in Uttar Pradesh, which is the biggest uh, Indian state, they have their own exam. Uttar Pradesh has more than 200 million inhabitants. And um, in these, this is an example from one of the JEE mains exams. And you see um, it is comparable to a European secondary school exam. Yeah, so it's uh, more focused on the technical part. So you have to solve a big integral or you have to solve an uh, inter integration problem. And uh, many, um, many uh, Indian schools have very competitive admission rates. For elite institutions, it uh, is typically below 2%, so the ratio of applicants to student intake, and uh, not even in Oxford or in, in uh, or these big British institutions, also many elitist American institutions, you have um, ratios that are so, so low. So people who actually manage to get into top institutions in India, they have overcome an enormous hurdle, an enormous barrier, and they are definitely worth um, a closer examination when they apply to your uh, to your job positions. Here is an example of the Christian Medical College in Valor, which actually has an admissions rate of 0.25%. Now, and we have we have gone, what have we done? We've looked at these university entrance exams and we have gone through heaves and heaves of PDF documents and we've looked at cutoffs. So each uh, um, uh, university publishes what is the last placement in a university entrance exam that was admitted to the uh, to the um, to this university program and um, this data is just enormous it's pdf documents with hundreds and hundreds of pages and sometimes you find things that you wouldn't expect like you find the name of the candidates of the, of the actual candidates that were admitted you find father's names and and whatnot so um, it is it is very unusual data but of course part of our job is to clean it and to make sure this doesn't end up in your product but that you have a nice scoring in the end and what we can supply to you is um, detailed information about the university entrance exam cutoffs from uh, different, uh, from over 14,000 uh, um, uh, colleges, uh, not colleges, from over 14,600 um, engineering courses. And um, this is the number of colleges we capture in the different states. So Uttar Pradesh, as I mentioned before, is the largest Indian state. So we have almost 500 in this state. And so overall, it is really, it is really a lot of data. And um, you will get a nice and neat case score um, as you get for uh, the other countries as well, with the only difference that for India, there are no great distributions that you could, uh, that you could use. It was not possible for us, although we tried very hard, um, it was not possible for us to garner the great distributions, but at least we can really tell you whether this was a super competitive school that your candidate uh, has been has been coming from, and we're gonna automate it. Um, we autom we are automating it the same way that we are already automating the other case scorings. This is an example from SAP Success Factors. Um, it basically shows uh, the job overview um, for one job opening. So here you have different candidates, and then you have a new column, and the column says case score, and you can sort according to the case score. And uh, of course, then if you have very good case scores, it draws your attention to this applicant and you can check them. And of course, if you if you wish and you can experiment with different rules based on case scores uh, and can make your, your recruiting um, really also your process more efficient because you have the case score at the moment that you have the application. So you don't need to wait for it. It comes um, right away in the very beginning. And um, we are also very flexible in the ways of how to bring it to you. We can have either the applicants uh, put in their 
um, their um, educational information into fields that are connected to our case API. Um, we can have the recruiter do that if you want that, but of course that creates a lot of effort and we can get it out of CVs um, if that is uh, what you what you desire um, together with the CV parser. So there's um, all different uh, avenues are open and of course it doesn't only work for SAP success factors, that is only one example, um, works for other ATS um, as well. All right. How am I doing with the time, Josh? I think I have a little bit over, but we I'm still a have a bit over. Okay, please forgive okay. me. I will open my, I will start my, uh, start my video and look forward to your questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, as before, feel free to write your questions in the chat. Uh, so just to start off, could you? Uh, explain a bit about the the free personality test used by Case. I think you mentioned you may have touched on that earlier in the presentation. Um, I think in this presentation I didn't, but I think in the previous uh -huh. presentation I did. Um, the free yeah. personality test, yes. Um, so I mentioned it. Uh, um, I mentioned that we use personality to mm -hmm. assess uh, university. No, to assess the competitiveness of students um, in the Fachkraft study for, for Germany. And um, it's also maybe an interesting piece of information for all of you who are thinking about using personality tests uh, in their daily HR work. Um, there is some good scientifically validated, there are some good scientifically validated tests that are open source. Yeah, there is um, something called the international, uh, the international personality item pool. Um, IPIP, uh, we can um, pr we can give you that link as well, and um, so we've used it uh, as when we were academics or when we we're still at the different universities, and um, we have we had to use it because if you think about more than three hundred thousand people in the Fachkraft study, if you imagine we had had to pay for every test to some I don't know test provider that would have really broken our bank, but um, yeah, so we can we can I will gladly supply that link to you and then um, if you're interested you can also use it in your process okay great uh, a question about these JE exams uh, how long would they normally be uh, what sort of things are covered would you say yes um, so let me go to that slide um, the J so as you can see from the table here um, there are actually quite a many different exams. The most common one is uh, the JE mains, which is an all India exam, but then many states have different ones. Um, the JE mains is six hours. So it's two papers, um, three hours each, and it's mostly technical questions. It's mostly because it's also for technical study subjects. It is mostly this. Um, and uh, yeah, the questions are comparable to to secondary school, uh, A level math, A level uh, physics, A level chemistry, Abitur math, etc. Questions. International baccalaureate. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, with regards to concepts like uh, maybe a cultural fit or other considerations, do you find those relevant for assessments like this for candidates yes. from these countries? Yes, and I think that's also, yes, that is a, that is a very important point. Um, and sometimes when I, then we, we, we present our solutions and I think that's a point that sometimes gets missed. Um, I'm not advocating that everything we do in HR or in, 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 the, in the process should be thrown overboard and should be replaced by the number that is being produced by case. That is, that is uh, not the argument. Of course, there's lots of other factors and um, cultural fit, especially with candidates uh, from um, a background that is so different from, from ours might be, might be a problem um, or might be, might be a concern. And there are also other, uh, of course, other, service providers that can help you with that and there's also some government um, help typically to to try to um, uh, make people acclimatize uh, i know for example that this german indian startup exchange uh, that we were working we are collaborating with they are very um, they, they are helping um, startups but i think they also help uh, larger companies when they want to hire somebody from india um, to basically make sure that a lot of the cultural boundaries are, are, are understood and are, are um, uh, navigated 
around. So there's there's help for that. And uh, but we are currently really focusing on these education degrees because um, the problem is big enough by itself. And so we, we only do that. Um, and um, I think if you if you think about how to use us then or how to use the k-score really do it at the very beginning um most um most efficiency is lost not in the creation of the of the the not picking the final person but in the creation of the shortlist and uh, this is where um gut feeling and sort of cv screening people are not very very good to make decisions just based on the paper on the on the cv and there's this is really the point where algorithms and then also hard facts like the k score can really make a very very big difference um, we, we give you a better shortlist and then based on that shortlist um you figure out who is fitting into the team etc and uh, navigate also those cultural problems for example now, something that uh, dave touched on as well in terms of sifting candidates is where really the, the efficiency loss really lies so it's a uh, it's a nice tie-in from the first talk to the second uh when will this be ready uh, for use by an hr team in terms of india yes um, we are we are working very hard on it, and I think it will be ready in the third quarter. So I expect it to be ready early autumn. Um, we, it has been in the making for a long time, for over two years, and um, we have lots of the data already cleaned and polished. This is why I can tell you we have 14,603 uh, courses that we are capturing, and now the, the remaining things um, lie with making it, making sure the automation works, that we can match to colleges really well, and things like this. So this is what we're currently doing, and then it will be up and running in autumn. Okay. Um, I can see that. Uh, oh, okay. I was about to say he's typing and I think uh, Nacho just uh, sent his question. So he asks, could you please name research on GPA as a predictive for performance? Also, do you think grade progression over the years should also be taken into account? Yeah, so there is not an enormous amount of research on GPA uh, of, um, on GPA on performance. Um, most scientific studies um, that look at GPA uh, are actually quite critical. So they, they they see GPA and they see it doesn't correlate. And this is something that we can replicate when we um, look at uh, our uh, customer studies as well. If you just take the raw GPA without having the context, there is too much noise. Maybe let's see whether I have a in my presentation. Sometimes I keep a backup slide for no, but I don't have it. Um, yeah. Okay. Maybe. Um, so what I what I will do uh, because I don't have uh, the material to answer this question perfectly here. Um, I will send uh, you an overview of what we do. Basically, how we try to show that uh, we can transfer the GPA into something that then can actually predict performance. Um, because one of the, one of my favorite slides is a slide where you see the GPA doesn't predict anything. Then you put the GPA into the context of the grade distribution. It gets slightly better. And then you put in uh, the the uh, the context, the the ranking of the study program, and then it gets quite decent. Um, but I don't have that slide in this presentation. But I will I will supply it later on. Um, uh, so to, to answer your question, there is some research. The research that I'm aware of is always a bit critical when it comes to GPA, but it completely confirms what we see in our customer studies. If we just use the GPA and close our eyes that it doesn't, that it's uh, about great distributions and the quality of the institutions, then we also don't find uh, very, very strong correlations. But if, if you do account for the context, it gets massively better. Okay, um, so if that's uh, the end of the questions, then uh, yeah, um, thank you very much for your time, Jan. I appreciate you taking the time to to explain uh, how this research has uh, propelled forward our understanding of the Indian market. Thank you for taking thank the time. Thank you very much, Rosh. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.